I uh, welcome. <laughs> We've uh, some of you, most of you probably have been part of this class during the summer. Uh, the intent was to get it started back with Sunday school. <clears throat> the hope is that we will uh, begin to have classes uh, here at church as well. But we want to keep uh, the opportunity for people to connect uh, through this uh, approach uh, so uh, we can get as many people as possible uh, to be able to participate. So thanks for being here. Uh, some of you I know were just in church and we it's it's a short transition. So uh, I'll, I'm going to try and work on a, a way to address that a little bit moving forward. But so thanks for being here this week. Uh, <clears throat> Andrew is uh, recording. So for people who didn't get here, we might they'll at least be able to see this if they want to. Uh, the intention of studying First John, which is what we're going to do for the next eight weeks or so, was primarily to kind of overlap the, um, the sermon series. So uh, the next ser series that starts this coming week uh, is going to be a be starting the working through the book of First John. So we're going to not necessarily walk section by section at exactly the same time, but we're going to be in the same uh, same book and studying some of the same themes. It is amazing, for those of you who've already been at church, that an awful lot of what we're talking about this morning is addressed in Andrew's sermon on uh, 1 Corinthians 15. So he talked to us just a little bit about the, the attitudes of the people at that time, the Greeks, and how they were challenging things like the resurrection. Uh, that's a, a big theme that's being addressed in the in First John. So we'll we'll see that a little bit uh, today, and you'll probably see that connection. Or if you're going to church after this, um, now I wanted to start by giving us just again not necessarily calling out answers, but a couple of questions to think about as we start. Uh, the this this question that uh, how do you know you're saved? And so again, I don't know that we have time, especially this morning, to give everybody the chance to answer that. But if somebody were to ask you that question, what would you answer? How do you know you are saved? Or, you know, a similar question, how can you be certain that you are a Christian? Or even another way of saying it, how can you be sure that you're saved? So how can you know that you're saved? How can you be sure that you are saved? Uh, and so, the, you know, the thought, how would you answer that question? Uh, and there's lots of ways probably to, to answer it, but think about that just for a second or two. How, how would you answer that if somebody asked you that question? How can you be sure that you are a Christian or how can you be sure that you're saved? Uh, and so as we start to work our way in the next uh, eight weeks, I think it's going to be through First uh, John, um, that's, I think that, well, I know that's a key question that we're going to be addressing. Uh, my strategy usually for doing some kind of study like this through a book of the Bible is to find multiple uh, commentaries. Uh, and so in addition to reading and reading and rereading uh, the book, uh, First John is not real long, so you can do that uh, pretty quickly, but, uh, but it's to find some solid, uh, reputable um, commentaries. So usually I ask the pastors, you know, you have a spare commentary on your shelf that I can borrow or that I can use. Uh, got a couple of, you know, got access to them through Grace College's library. Uh, and so multiple books are used in, in preparation for this. It usually ends up by the second or third week, I've kind of narrowed it down to a couple that seem to really give us the, the focus that, that we need. Uh, and today I've already uh, centered in on one commentary by uh, James Montgomery Boyce, uh, who was a, was a Presbyterian pastor. Uh, this comes from a series of sermons that he preached. Um, and it's, it's interesting that as I've read these commentaries this week, the, most of them are saying, you know, this book was written to address heresies, which we'll see in a moment or two. Uh, it was written to address some of the incorrect teachings that, that were pulling people away. So again, if you've already been in the sermon or if you, when you're going to the sermon later this morning, uh, that's exactly what Andrew was presenting and in, in, that Paul was doing at the end of uh, 1 Corinthians. But Boyce makes a different theme, a little different focus. And I really like this. I think it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that I think he's emphasizing it more in this series that he, 
comes from a series of sermons that he preached. But he says that the dominant theme of 1 John is Christian assurance. And so I've been asking you that question here. How do you know you're saved? Or how can you be sure that you are saved? And he says that as he started preparing to, to preach this series of sermons, he said he thought that we should be assured of salvation primarily because God says that those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ possess it. So I'm, I'm reading from the introduction here to his book. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater. It says that in 1 John. But he says, as I studied, I began to see that while this is true, the Apostle John also works on a more practical level, showing that the Christian can be assured of his salvation in that God has brought about fundamental changes in his life. You can be assured of your salvation because God has brought about fundamental changes in your life. He has given us a sure knowledge of himself in Jesus Christ. It involves the truth. He's given us a desire to pursue and obey the commandments of God. So it involves righteousness. And he's given us a new relationship with other believers that involves love. And so we're titling this series, uh, the Truth, Righteousness, and Love. And, and light is another theme that we're going to see. And so uh, as we study this, uh, we'll come back to this idea that the, the book, uh, and we'll ask this question specifically in a few moments here, uh, that we are, we are reading this book uh, for the assurance or to see how we can be assured and confident that we really do Christ has promised us. And so today the goal is to do kind of a real quick overview. I, I emailed a handout. Uh, by the way, if, if you notice people that you think, well, they ought to be here, uh, let me know. I'll add them to the email list. It's kind of hard to know who to send things to. Um, but as we, we're going to just look at kind of an overview preparation and the reading homework uh, for today or for this next week will be preparation for the sermon next week. Um, it's kind of cool. Andrew and Aaron both have been sending out uh, emails to the staff as we prepare for each Sunday. Uh, and so we already get a sense of where we're headed with this next sermon series. So today, a, a brief overview of First John uh, and these um, four questions will be answered. So Andrew, if you want to maybe share the the slides with us. So I've got a PowerPoint again. Um, the, the next slide, <clears throat> the, four, the four things we want to talk real briefly about this morning are who wrote this? You know, it says first John. So there's kind of a hint there probably that most people think John or somebody named John wrote it. Uh, who's it written to? Uh, when was it written and why was it written? And so we're not going to belabor some of these points, but I think it's at least worth us, us thinking through those and being aware of that. So uh, the author, next slide, is it's pretty well established by most people that John wrote it. So if you want to flip to the next slide, um, it's, it, we never actually uses the term, I'm sorry, yeah, back up one, so sorry. Uh, he never really uses the term uh, that he is an apostle, uh, and, uh, but if you read this book and you follow it up by reading second and third John, uh, there's a similarity there and, and you get a sense of, of him uh, kind of representing himself. And so I'll see some evidence here that John, when you re read the gospel of John, this is probably the same John that we're talking about, almost certainly. He never really named himself in the entire gospel of John. He talked about the, the disciple that Jesus loved. Uh, and, and when he was talking about himself. And so he never uses his name in this one either, which in some ways makes it seem like it, it must be him because it's kind of that same, that same pattern. But as you start the book of First John, uh, he begins, the writing of this sounds a lot like the gospel of John. If you go back and read the first chapter, of half, first half of the first chapter of the gospel of John, you'll hear very similar uh, language uh, being used. 
Uh, and and in, in this case, in 1 John, it starts out by saying, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And in the gospel, he talks of the, in the beginning was the word. Uh, and the, the life was manifest and we have seen it. And we testify and proclaim it to you. I mean, he's, he's identifying himself as an eyewitness. I, I use the word an ear witness. He said somebody who has heard in person, someone who has seen with his own eyes, someone who has personally, physically had contact with Jesus, uh, the word. Uh, so he's identifying himself as someone that fits this category and he's testifying to us. So he's establishing authority uh, through the fact that he, he was there. He knows what Jesus was doing and saying, and he was taught personally uh, by Jesus. Uh, and, you know, this notion that he's reputable and, and reliable, uh, and the, again, the timing here is important, and we'll see this a little bit later, but uh, even as we heard from the late 80s, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, uh, he was already talking to the people there about the fact that, okay, the church has been established, but we're, uh, we're losing some of the truth. We're, we're, we're veering off from the truth. Uh, and John is doing much the same thing here. He's, he's saying, look, go back to the beginning. Uh, go back to the beginning of the church. What were you taught? Uh, what did I tell you? What did the other apostles tell you? Uh, and, and don't veer off, don't, don't lose track of, of that message. The, there's plenty of evidence that, that this is John, uh, it would be John the disciple, so one of the 12. Uh, he and his brother James would be the two, you know, the sons of Zebedee and all that. The next slide uh, gives us kind of that, um, that picture. Uh, this is the same author who wrote the gospel, uh, and again, you can compare the first chapter especially to, to that, um, you can, um, you know, there's, there's statements in, in the Gospel of John uh, where he says, ask and you'll receive and your joy will be complete. That's John 16. And in this letter, this epistle, he says, we write this to make our joy complete. So there are a number of themes like that. Uh, in, in the Gospel of John, he's, Jesus is quoted as saying, a new commandment I give you, love one another. In the first epistle, this first John, uh, John's writing, and this is his command to love one another. So again, there are numerous themes like that that are repeated, and, and it's, it's almost certain that this is John, the, the disciple, John the apostle, who's writing. Uh, you can click to the next slide there where it, it talks about him being the uh, the early fathers of the church. And so these are the historians, the people who were also writing then 100 years later, or 50 years after this was written, uh, who were also already saying this was written by John. Uh, Polycarp would be one example. He was actually a student of John, and he writes talking about this particular letter and refers to John as the author. So the early church accepted very, very confidently that John wrote this, although he never names himself uh, anywhere uh, in the letter. Uh, but the, the style, some people would say the style is very similar, others would challenge that a little bit, but it's pretty well accepted. Uh, Martin Luther said this, I don't know if we have a slide of this, but I think it's in your notes. This is an outstanding epistle. It can buoy up uh, the afflicted heart Furthermore, it has John's style, his manner of expression, so beautifully and gently does it picture Christ to us. And so, I mean, Martin Luther is not our only authority, obviously, but it was accepted throughout the church uh, that this was written by John. And why is that important? Um, mainly because of the authority. Uh, this is scripture, it's God's word, it's inspired by God, uh, but it's written by an eyewitness. Uh, it's written by someone who knew Jesus, spent you know extensive time with him, was there at all the way through the ministry of Jesus, was there at the at the crucifixion, uh, saw him again. Uh, Andrew mentions this in the sermon this morning. Saw him with his own eyes, risen from the dead. Saw the empty tomb. Uh, spent time with Jesus. And if you remember, um, 
Jesus had a special encounter with Peter uh, where he said, um, you know, if you believe me, you will feed my sheep. Uh, John was there. Uh, there were these conversations that said, well, what about this guy? You know, Peter says, you know, what about him? What, if, you know, is he going to live forever? Because you told me how I'm going to die. And, and John did live longer than any of the other apostles. Uh, and, and so near the end of his life, he's writing and he's encouraging people to hold fast to these truths that we've taught. Uh, don't, don't veer off. This letter is probably written to uh, people near Ephesus because John was kind of the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Uh, that would be primarily Gentiles. Uh, he doesn't talk in this uh, letter much at all about Jews. Uh, so probably the, the mindset would be more of Greek and, and Gentile. And even the, the inerrancy, the errancies that he's teaching against, the heresies he's teaching against, came, came out of some of the way that the Greeks interpreted life. But it is written to the church. And so that, that's big C church, not just the people living in Ephesus, but to all Christians. And that includes today's churches as well. So he's writing this to us. Uh, and he's writing this with the authority uh, that comes from being a, an eyewitness. Um, so we, again, it's, he's an elder. He calls himself that in, in Second John and Third John. Uh, it's probably written toward the end of his life, uh, sometime between 90 and 95, so 80, 90, 95. He probably wrote this one in Second John and Third John in order uh, during that time frame. And then he died around AD 98, and he was in Ephesus, so he was in that area, and so this is really just, he's writing to them, uh, and he's encouraging them, and then this letter, because it's, it is identified as scripture, is also, uh, you know, written in, in, and it's spread to other churches as well, but again, he's, these churches were established, they, if it's 90, 92, 93, uh, that means there have been churches in Ephesus for 30, 40 years. Uh, and so these people had been taught by Paul. Uh, they'd been taught by John. Uh, they had been established in the truth. Paul had written these letters that had circulated through already, the letters to the Corinthians and others that were circulated through all these areas. And and so he's telling them here as he, we get, we won't move forward yet, but as he's telling them this idea of here's the truth, hold fast to the truth. Uh, this is what, this is a new command, but he even says that, but it's not a new command. It's, it's the new command that was given by Jesus. And so again, the, the confidence we can have, and you can read plenty of, of reputable commentaries who would say it was written by John probably written during this time frame from AD 90 to AD 95. Uh, it's written to the people specifically in Ephesus. And, and we have the authority uh, and the heart of a pastor uh, who's teaching us uh, with a purpose. And so again, the question then becomes, what is this purpose? Uh, and and the, there are multiple purposes. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, for the sake of time here, we'll go kind of quickly, but uh, the assurance of, of eternal life. This is, this is maybe the big theme. Uh, and so, by the way, I'd encourage you to, you've got these on your notes, but you need to read these verses for yourself. Uh, we don't have time to read all of them uh, in, in detail, but this, the assurance of, of life. So I do want you to turn to, if you got your Bibles, which I hope you have them with you, uh, to 1 John 5, uh, verse 13. Uh, so as you get, it's, there's five chapters here. So he gets to the end, near the end, and he tells us in verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. This is his kind of summary statement. Of, this is why I'm writing to you. Uh, that you may know that you have eternal life. Uh, and so again, this same writer who wrote the Gospel of John, uh, at the end, near the end of the Gospel of John, 
He said, these are written that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. He's saying here, I'm writing to you so that you may have the confidence that you know Jesus and that he is the source of eternal life. Uh, Paul talks about that in uh, Thessalonians, his letter. He said, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. So there's again this confidence, this conviction that it is that it is true, full assurance of faith, uh, complete understanding. The writer of the Hebrews, uh, writer of Hebrews says, uh, we since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere heart and full assurance of faith. And he goes on. If we look at uh, Colossians 2, Paul's writing, encouraging your heart <laughs> so that we may have the full riches of complete understanding. So this theme is, is mentioned multiple times as we read through scripture. Even in Isaiah, there's this statement that, that says that we are, uh, so that we will have this, this confidence. But Paul, or excuse me, John goes into great detail in this letter uh, giving us very specific statements uh, that show us uh, why we should have confidence. And, and here's the key. What, what kind of assurance can we have? Uh, so the next slide, I believe, has the other verses listed. So all of these are from 1 John. And I'm just going to go kind of quickly. But again, he's saying, I've, I've written these things to you this is in, so that you will have the assurance or so that you will know that you have eternal life. But then as you read through 1 John, uh, you keep coming to these statements. And so I'm just going to read them quickly. Uh, this is how we know we are in him. That's 2.5. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. 2.13. 2.20 says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. In, in the next chapter, uh, he says, dear friends, now we are children of God. Uh, in verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life. In verse 24, or sorry, actually there's verse 19, which I think I skipped here. But verse 19 says, uh, we belong to the truth. And then we know that he lives in us. How do we know this? This is kind of that way he's leading us to. In verse, chapter 4, you, dear children, are from God. We know that we live in him and he in us. And then in chapter 5, this is how we know that we love the children of God. We know, we know, we know, it says in the end. So again, it, the point here is that over and over and over and over and over again, he's, he's telling us you can have confidence that you are truly one of God's children and the confidence comes, by the way, as mentioned in the sermon this morning, part of the reason for the confidence is because of the changed life that, that Paul talked about, and John is talking about that as well. So as we go through the book, we're going to be looking at three kind of major areas of life, and that's listed on this next slide. It's on your notes. Um, you know, I think the, the flip side of that is true also, Jeff, is go ahead. That you know, as, as we read through these things, and if, if it seems like, hey, that doesn't apply to me, then it, it could be that, that you're not saved. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yes, I would, I would agree with that exactly. Uh, so the, the, the tests then, these am I saved, uh, by the way, are basically tests of life. You know, are, are you alive? Uh, and how do you know you're alive? Uh, well, what's the evidence of that? And, and this is what, what uh, John is going to be telling us. And so we'll come back to this over and over as we go through uh, these passages. Uh, but there's a moral test. Uh, and that is a life of obedience. And, and this is one of the things that's challenged by the people that were in Ephesus there. And again, this is what the Corinthians were dealing with that Paul was writing to them. Are we supposed to be uh, obeying? Uh, 
uh, this moral test. You know, are we expected to live a moral and righteous life? Uh, the social test, a test of love. Do we love one another? Uh, is that characteristic in your life? Uh, is that characteristic in the life of our church? And then finally, the, the, the doctrinal or theological question, which is a, a practical one, and it's asking that question, you know, do you, do you claim that you believe, do you, do you claim to believe in this preexistent son of God, the second person of the Trinity who became flesh and died and rose from the dead? Is that what you are believing in or are you twisting uh, and, and changing from that, that core of what we're supposed to believe? And so again, over and over again, you're gonna, we're gonna see John emphasizing, this is what I taught you and parentheses, this is what Peter and Paul and others were writing and teaching because it's what Jesus taught us. Uh, and therefore this is what we, we hold fast to. And so there's error that's being addressed in, in this book, in this letter. Um, and, and the errors uh, fall into a couple of different categories. So there's warnings here. One of the main, one of the main warnings is this uh, warning against Gnosticism. Uh, and again, we, we don't need to study that in great detail, but Gnosticism was a, a belief uh, of people who we're saying there's no need for moral conduct because, hey, the body is evil and only the spirit matters. And so whatever you're doing in your body doesn't really matter because it's not going to last. Uh, and so we don't need to worry about moral conduct. All we need to worry about is this, you know, my soul is, you know, loves Jesus. That sounds a lot to me like spirituality today that's not part of Christianity. Doesn't matter whether we obey Jesus, it only matters that we are spiritual or that we, uh, that we love. And, and then they're denying the deity of Christ. And so we'll see a little more details of this in a moment. But the idea here is that they did not believe in the resurrection, which again, think about the sermon we just heard. They did not believe that God cared about the body. Uh, they said there's, the body was evil and therefore the body is just for this life. And it doesn't matter what you do in your body. The only thing that matters somehow is in your, in your spirit. And they said that Jesus couldn't have been God because his body would have been evil. Uh, and therefore, um, he was just this person and God had kind of put his presence on him. Remember at the baptism, his presence came upon Jesus, but they weren't the same thing. So Gnosticism exalts knowledge. And the key to everything is knowing the truth, knowing. Uh, new, and they led them to teachers, even in the in AD 60s, but especially by this point, uh, that they had a new understanding of scripture. So I, I would say uh, in parentheses here, you need to be careful of anybody who has a new understanding of scripture. It doesn't mean that they might not have something they've discovered that's worth hearing, but a new understanding of scripture uh, should be at least uh, something we pay attention to. What is, what is this new understanding? Is it orthodox? Is it based on the teachings of Jesus and the apostles? And they were basically separating themselves from the uninitiated Christians and saying, we understand more and more fully than you do, and you're out, and we're, we're now the ones who uh, have the authority. So that's part of this heresy that's being addressed in the writing of this book. Also, uh, next slide, they, um, they, they said the world is evil, so I've, I've said this a little bit, but that means that the, the world doesn't really matter. And, and they didn't even believe that the God of the Old Testament was the same God as the Supreme God, because he created this world and the world was evil. Uh, and so he can't be the supreme God. He was some inferior God. And so they're, they're twisting all these truths. They're not seeing God uh, and the Old Testament, the New Testament as one story. Uh, they're not accepting uh, this biblical account of what happened to creation and why there's evil in the world. Uh, and so again, Paul, uh, John is saying to them, don't listen to this teaching. It's, it's pulling us away from, from the truth 
uh, that we know and that we have been taught and that I have been teaching uh, so that you uh, can know what Jesus told us. And then the next slide, uh, the idea of the incarnation is not acceptable. And again, because the divine word, Jesus can't live in a, Christ can't live in an impure body. And so Christ came upon Jesus, but he didn't dwell in him. They weren't the same. And so there's another error. Uh, Jesus, uh, we are taught, is God and man in one, fully God, fully man. And they're saying, no, no, that can't be true. And so therefore, they're saying there's no resurrection. So by the way, great tie into today's sermon. If there's no resurrection, we have no hope. The whole story is false. Uh, the, whole, the whole description of what happens isn't true. So this is what John is addressing in his writing. He's attacking this. He's pointing out that these teachings are not true. Uh, he's trying to emphasize that there's something more than just the soul. And by the way, that, that kind of struck me just a little bit. Are we... Do we overemphasize even today, <clears throat> we want to save souls? Yeah, but do we, do we want to, um, we want people to get saved. We want, because we know they do have an eternal destiny. Their body will be you know, transformed, but there is a physical uh, life uh, ahead of us for, and it isn't only a spiritual life ahead of us. So again, we want to try uh, to emphasize that. So I'm, I'm going to show you this next slide. We're not going to take the time to go through it. Uh, I've listed these verses in your notes. Uh, this new command, and again, this isn't a new command that John is giving. He's emphasizing the new command uh, that Jesus gave, and it's listed there in John 13, 34. And over and over again, as you read the, this letter, and we're going to come to this, this idea of love as an as an indicator of our life in Christ. How do we know we are Christians? We're known by our love. Uh, and so you'll see that list. And, and I would encourage you uh, over the next uh, you know, weeks, if not this week, uh, to read through those verses just individually and see some of the comments that are being made. But this is a kind of that other emphasis in the purpose. So it's the assurance of salvation, the, the attacking the heresies of Gnosticism and other heresies, and to emphasize this new command that we were given to love one another. So love God and love others. Uh, and we're going to see that over and over again as we go through uh, this book or this letter. Um, I wanted to read uh, one more thing to us before we end. And I wanted to end a little bit early just for the sake of, uh, of time and comments. But back to the introduction to this book, by uh, to the letter of First John by uh, James Boyce. He says this, and I think it's a good, kind of a good concluding idea. He says, love without righteousness is immorality. Though today in some religious circles, it's called a new morality. Did you hear that? Love without righteousness is immorality, though today in some religious circles it's called the new morality. He also says righteousness without doctrine is legality or legalism. This is the kind of religion that existed in Christ's day in Judaism and against which he was so outspoken. And he goes on to say, doctrine without love is bitter. It is the kind of truth that is rigorously perfect in a sense, but which doesn't win anyone. All three of these elements must be present in the life of a true and growing Christian. Consequently, it's, and he's writing here, my, my wish that the study might be used of the Holy Spirit to contribute to such growth in the lives of many persons. Emphasis on love, righteousness, truth, doctrine that holds to orthodox teachings uh, so that we 
uh, can have a life that is not only that we are assured in our own sense, but that our lives testify to others that we do bring the message of Christ. Uh, I'll probably use this next week as we as we get more into the actual text of, of 1 John. But J.I. Packer points out that if we study scripture simply to be knowledgeable, we've completely missed the point of studying scripture. The study of scripture isn't about just knowing, it's about uh, being changed by Christ, by the Holy Spirit, uh, so that we can love others and so that we can win others uh, to, to Christ. And so again, the, the goal here, I think that John is saying is very clearly that, that we are not just here for head knowledge. Uh, we are here to have changed hearts so that we can uh, love uh, and loving will result in more people being uh, brought into the kingdom. So I, I'm excited to be able to, to participate again. I thanks for joining. We've got to figure out some details here of if you go to church, how do you get here in time? So I know some of you made it home pretty quickly and, and jumped in. So thanks for doing that. But um, well, we'll the goal eventually is that we're going to have a Sunday school class or maybe two uh, being taught here in the church. And then at least one will be somehow connected through the Zoom for those people who are still not coming in on Sundays. So uh, we may transition to something like that. Uh, pretty soon. Uh, so I would appreciate your, your prayers for the staff as we try to figure out how to make that happen. Uh, keep praying for the volunteers that we need to do the kids ministries. Uh, and I, I've listed some homework there on the bottom of the uh, of the page. I would encourage you to read through the first John. Uh, the, the, go ahead and go to that slide you were just on. Here. That's the um, text for this coming Sunday. So I think the, very, the first four verses, I believe, is what uh, Aaron will be preaching from. Uh, and so as you even just pre preparation for Sunday, uh, there's, there's the text. So at least be reading through that. Uh, I think that it'll, I'm hopeful that this is going to connect and we'll see some uh, benefit from studying the same things in Sunday school that we're, we're hearing about in the sermon. So anybody have any last comments before we wrap up today? I do. Jeff, uh, I missed your, your third point from Boyce, doctrine without love, what? Okay, I closed the book, so let me find it. Anybody want to have a different question? I'll, uh, actually, I got it right here, so let me, let me do this. He says, love without righteousness is immorality. Righteousness that. without doctrine is legalism. And doctrine without love is a bitter orthodoxy. Okay. It's the kind of truth that's rigorously perfect, but it doesn't win anyone. It's legalistic. Thanks. Any, any, other, any other questions or comments before we wrap up? Let me pray for us and then we'll check out. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to gather even this way and, and look at the things that you want us to know. I pray that as we study this book and especially as we're able to, to participate in the sermons that will go through 1 John as well, that you would help us uh, as individuals to learn truth, but truth that is winsome, truth that is loving, uh, help us to emphasize holy living without legalism. Uh, help us to understand that uh, knowledge is not just our own opinion, but that it must be taught to us through your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we ask you to do that for us and through us. We ask you to bless our church, uh, that we can have a, an outreach to this community and that we can love each other well. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Miss you, Andrew and Steph. Thank you. Yes, I agree with that last statement. <laughs> we should get to back to Warsaw soon for a visit. <laughs> we'll do. Where is Andrew and Steph? 
So if, if you're heading to church, to hop off they quick and start driving. So they moved to Michigan. We did. Yes. Yep. Oh no! I didn't know yeah. that. Not many people do know that. <laughs> We're in Michigan. Our hometown, Hillsdale. Hillsdale, where the college is. Yes. That's correct. Okay, I have a friend that her that had gone there, so. Yeah, we got well, the opportunity to build on my grandparents' farm. So, have you broke ground yet? Um, we broke ground on the driveway. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> Pro plans are in process, and I'm I'm working remote for Zimmer Biomet still. So, um, and yeah. coming coming back, you know, like every other week type thing. Well, you're not far. How far are you? Go back and visit. That's hour, right. Hour fifty minutes. Okay. Yeah. So Steph, were you saying about pops or that? Yeah, I'm still going to try and head it up this year because we're, we decided to go remote anyway because we didn't want to gather all the littles together uh -huh. and try and find childcare. So I haven't started that yet, but we're going to start soon now that the threes are started. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Andrew, can you go to the grid screen? Sure. We can see all who's still here. There we go. Great. <laughs> 